persons who are listening live of ZB by radio and those of you who are watching live on social media I'm here Marlon Penn who's here with my colleagues Arnold Julian Fraser member for the third district in Alba Melvin Mitch Tumble member for the second district here as promise as an opposition to bring to you a week a monthly press conference of opposition as we started in November of last year and we said that we'll be with you every month thereafter. This, first of all, Happy New Year to everyone. I think those of us who are listening, those who are watching, the major persons here present. Uh, we are here as an opposition. It was a very event, eventful week um, in the life of politics in the BVI. But we are here in solidarity. And I also want to give apologies for Ambo Mark Vanterpool, who isn't here this, at this time. We are here to fulfill our mandate as an opposition um, to deal with the issues as we see arise as it relates to the territory, uh, relates to moving the country forward. In our first meeting, we outlined some key areas of concerns for us, and those issues were the issue of, of the recovery, which was paramount on, on one of those issues. We now have a situation where we have the head of the RDA, Mr. Paul Bailey, has since resigned from the RDA. The RDA is charged with the majority of the work as it relates to the recovery of the territory. Um, we have an issue where the, the loan guarantee that was promised by the UK and, and the deadline was, supposed, was met on the end of September. We're now in the middle of January, going into the end of January, and we've yet to finalize that loan guarantee. We're concerned regarding the pace of the recovery of this territory. Now that we have the resignation of Paul Bailey, we have a budget that requires $42 million in loans to perform um, the recovery of this territory. It leaves us in a very uncertain place as it relates to our territory's recovery. As opposition, we are intended to dip deeper as it relates to the issue of recovery and hold the government to account for the recovery of this territory after Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Last time we were discussing the issue of the Public Accounts Committee, we have subsequently formed the Public Accounts Committee, and we've scheduled meetings starting February 4th to look at the government um, audited accounts, to look at specific audited um, reports that were done by the Auditor General and the Internal Auditor. We have gone back to at least 16 years, because we know the last four years and, and the time before, we never had an active Public Accounts Committee. Is our intent to be extremely active. Um, we have scheduled meetings for every week after the fort to, to dive into those audited reports, the audited accounts, to ensure that there's some accountability in the way government's money is spent, the way projects are executed. Um, some of the key projects that we've, we've raised as a red flag, the issue of the festival committee and festivals over the years have, have also always been a red flag. In particular this year, where over $2 million was spent on festival, and we've yet to have a proper accounting of how the monies were spent, and it's something that we're going to delve in, in at the public accounts committee, as well as projects that happened under the last administration. Um, and we 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 are not going to be partisan in our approach to examining the government spending and government's projects. Um, the issue, as well as of victimization and the issue of cronyism, we're we're deeply concerned uh, that that after our November press conference where we raised this issue to the armor members, um, the other people, the persons in this public uh, and the wider into the media, that it's more prevalent now than before. Uh, persons are afraid to speak out. Persons are afraid to, to speak against anything that the government is doing. It's fair victimization. It's, all, it's all already reached members of the Honorable House of Assembly and their families. And, and, and this is a, a situation of concern for all of us. And we have to say to the people of this territory that this is a democracy. The Riva is a democracy, and you have a right to hold your government account, and you should do that with fair, without fair victimization or retribution. And the bullying and, and the victimization that is happening currently is something that is of great concern to us in our democracy. 
we have to ensure as elected members of this honorable house of assembly and the opposition that we call out and speak on behalf of the people who feel that they're voiceless in this regards you have the the issue with the boards that continues to pre be prevalent where board members are getting involved in the day-to-day -day runnings of, 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 of these, uh, these institutions and the operations. It's an issue of grave concern. Um, just a, a few of the issues that we have, uh, we've outlined. Um, we intend, as we said, to be more robust this, this year, this new year. We expect to, to dive into the issues of, of these issues and more issues. And the issue of financial services and the, and the economy of these territories is one of those issues that are of great concern. Financial services lost $30 million last year in revenue. We recently heard of the blacklisting from France and what the implication that might have for us as a territory and, and our industry as a whole. We've yet to see a plan to deal with the issue of economic substance, which is something that is very important. The member for the third has speak, spoken at, in, at infinitum on this issue of economic substance and the benefit that could be derived for the territory of these Virgin Islands and how we need to sit down as a group and devise a plan to move this territory forward as it relates to that industry and overall diversification of the economy. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's your press conference media. We're here to, to hear from you. Um, the issue of the resignation of Armel Keynes from the opposition and the NAP have made a statement publicly on that. Uh, I think I stand by my statement. And we are here as opposition to move forward. We're, we're ready to move forward and do the work of the people, the work of the of the Virgin Islands and the work of the opposition and, and make sure that the people of this territory have proper representation, that you have a robust and active opposition, and that is what we plan to do moving forward, and we're open to any questions, any comments or concerns you might have. Kathy Richards, JTV News. Uh, Honorable Penn, you spoke mm -hmm. of a number of issues, you tick on a number of issues yeah. uh, that uh, you see the territory is facing, but specifically, could you talk to us a little bit about the resignation of uh, Mr. Bailey from the RDA? Uh, were you <coughs> surprised at mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. and what are the likely implications of uh, such a, mm -hmm. uh, a shift at this time? I, I really can't say I'm surprised because, as, as we have said, the RDA has been started in terms of funding to execute its, uh, its, its mandate and agenda as it relates to the recovery. Um, I think it has serious implications because there's a recovery development plan that, that is on the table for RDA. They have a, a particular mandate to, re, to develop a, a large portion of the infrastructure as, the, as it relates to the territory. Um, the road infrastructure, as we see, a lot of those the road has been undermined from the, the storms and the flooding that we had recently. Um, without leadership uh, at, that, at that institution, it, it says to me that that process will stall. Um, we, uh, I am concerned, I know members are concerned about the pace of the recovery. As I said earlier, we haven't um, finalized the loan guarantee, which would underpin the actual recovery process for the territory. Um, the loans ultimately have to be approved by the United Kingdom, and it has to come to the House of Assembly for approval. We have a budget currently of 49 plus million dollars of loans that need to be approved in order to, to carry out the government's agenda as a way to recovery. That doesn't speak to the actual loans that is necessary for the RDA to carry out their responsibilities. So this is a blow for us in our recovery. I think it, it, it stalls the process and then we have a, a, we are really concerned in terms of the pace of the economy being recovered and the physical infrastructure. As we would have heard the Premier say that uh, mm -hmm. this would uh, open up the opportunity for locals to apply for that position in the RDA. Uh, do you support this move that this is something that should be taken up by locals? I think every opportunity in the Virgin Islands should be taken up by locals. And if there's an opportunity where a local could fit that role, so be it. But I think we need to move on with whatever needs to happen, whether we put a local in, in place or put someone in place to ensure that the recovery of this territory happens. We've, we've fallen behind significantly as it relates to the issues of grants, the issues of support from, from donor nations around the territory, around the region um, for support for recovery. We've lost the sympathy because we have, we've had um, the issue with, with the Bahamas recently and all the different territories who have hit Puerto Rico just recently with the earthquakes. So the sympathy towards BVI in terms of our recovery now, almost three years out, is gone. So it, it says that it's on the backs of 
the people of this territory, back on the leadership of this territory, to ensure that the funding is made available to facilitate the recovery of our physical infrastructure, our sewage infrastructure, our water infrastructure, where we have serious issues, and most importantly, for the recovery of our economy. Okay, can I ask Honorable Fraser yeah. and Honorable uh, Mitch Turnbull to weigh in on that last question for me, please? Sure. Good morning. I'm Honorable Julian Fraser, representative for the third district, uh, member of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. And I'm glad that you, the media, still see the opposition as a viable uh, transit for the good governance of this territory and that you could come here this morning to be a part of this press conference. The question about the uh, Mr. Bailey of the RDA resigning, you ask the question whether or not the leader of the opposition or, or any one of us were surprised at his resignation. I was. I was for several reasons. One, that the Honorable Premier, who was a member of the opposition at the time when the RDA was formed, he took the position that it was necessary and he supported it unlike myself who didn't, and, and the member for the second district who's here as well, who didn't support the whole initiative of the RDA formation, RDA's formation. The claim that the CEO should be some high-powered, highfalutin individual who with, with vast experience came about because they thought that it was necessary to have someone with a high profile, given that the budget for the RDA is not $326 million that the British government loans guarantee represent, but it's $700 plus million. And the bulk of that money, probably $400 million, was to come through uh, donors, grants, and what have you. And the individual running the organization should be someone with a profile that can attract that kind of, uh, of uh, financing. So it, was no, it, was no, it wasn't an accident that the individual who they got to run the RDA was from the other side of the world, somewhere in the Pacific, and not from the BVI. If it was the Premier's wish to see a local run the RDA, that should have been his position initially from the time he supported the, 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 the initiative. So I, I don't particularly buy this whole issue and scenario about a local run in the RDA. I, I'll be surprised if they went that route. And then again, you never know. It depends on what they want the RDA to do. It, it's, it's not going to be the RDA that was formed. It's going to be another RDA. And then to that point, it becomes probably unnecessary. I had never supported the RDA and any comments I made regarding the RDA and the CEO is not directed at Mr. Bailey in a general. So I am not the most hopeful individual as far as that project is concerned right now. Good morning to the Virgin Islands community, to the media, um, those online and to everyone listening via ZBVI. Melvin Mitch Turnbull, representative for the second district. Um, to answer your question, Kathy, and again, I want to thank the leader of the opposition um, and the member for the third for being here and keeping true to our word um, to have these monthly meetings to give our voice um, as the members of the opposition. The question to regarding the RDA, uh, the member for the third, uh, I guess he, he's in my thoughts as well. Um, as he said, I, I did not support the RDA unlike the current premier. And the issue that I, that we are facing, if we are not careful the amount of talking that is happening 
the amount of chatter, every opportunity that is given and sometimes even not given. You, you talk yourself. It's, it's like a car salesman that's trying to get you buy a lemon. And they just keep talking fast, 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 hoping that you don't pay attention to what is actually going on. When the CEO, and I, I said it to somebody that I was having a conversation with, um, in regards to the same statement about the CEO of the, the RDA now having an opportunity to, to be a local, Honorable Fraser gave the background for how it was set up and what it entails. I said to someone, when I looked at the job description that was set for the CEO of the RDA, because our argument was, if we're going to build back this Virgin Islands, just as it was done 50 or 60 years ago by our forefathers, it was done by us, by our people through prayers and belief in God and working hand in hand. If we're going to build back this Virgin Islands, why not build it back with our own people? But when you looked at the requirements, and I'm asking persons that if you look at the requirements for the RDA, the CEO of the RDA, you would realize that it was never intended for Biva Elena to qualify for that position. Now, hearing the because Mr. Billy has now resigned is again talked to now we can make way for BBL and the premier has the opportunity if he so wishes to do that but why was the RDA set up what was the RDA supposed to do and again I reiterate as I have been saying in the house of assembly and I have said now currently even the last administration, as well as this administration, is operated in contravention to the law that was passed that I voted against and the Honorable Member for the Third voted against because the RDA was supposed to be set up to deal with the recovery and development of the Virgin Islands after the, the devastation storms of 2017. Now, where we are now is a lot of fast talk, a lot of things shifting and things operating as if, you know, we're trying to get it together. Where we are and where my position and where our position is going to be from here going forward is it, it, it is yours now. No more excuses and all the fast talking. We're going to check you, fact check you on the things that you are saying so that the people of the Virgin Islands are not disguised. Um, by all the talk and missed the mark. So if I was surprised, I was surprised by Mr. Bailey because um, him and I have had several meetings since his appointment as CEO in terms of the things specifically for my district, the second district, and as well as the overall plans of the Virgin Islands. So now to see that um, we now have to go through a whole process again or what that process will be like, um, it leaves us a lot, a lot of questions. Zan Lewis, ZB Very, you will get back to that. But Mr. Penn, you outlined a number of issues um, that you looked at when you made your official statement. But and the resignation of um, Ms. Maduro Keynes just happened to fit in between there. I know that she is um, a member of the NDP, but she was a member of the opposition. Yeah. Is it um, not saying much about it now in the opening speech? Is an indication that is not no blow. It didn't care, didn't come as a blow to you. It's not felt so much by the opposition. Basically, so what? You you moving on uh, because of your your comments about it. How do the opposition see it? We we've, we've moved on, and we've I've put out a statement <clears throat> this week that spoke to our concerns and how the how the whole process happened. Um, Alba Mudukin has the right to make a decision. She's made a decision. And we've moved on. We've moved on. We're here now to talk about the plans for the opposition moving forward, the plans for this territory moving forward. There are important issues and very serious issues. You heard my colleague just say about fact-checking fact checking, and the fast-talking. The people of the Beaver has to pay attention to what's happening in this country. We have an issue where economy is on a decline. Financial services is down $30 million from last year. We are blacklisted by France. 
No telling what will happen with financial services this year as a result of that blacklist. There's no clear path where we could fill that gap of that $30 million and continue to slacken off our economy. We don't see a vision. You see a lot of fast uh, talk. You see a lot of pie in the sky, smoke and mirror plans that has no substance behind of them. You yet to see something that's, that, that is initiated that brings or garners any, any real revenue or real benefit or jobs for the people of this territory. Let me ask one more um, question on that. The situation with Maduro Keynes came as a blow, I believe, to the opposition. It came as a surprise. It was not expected. Mm -hmm. I believe the opposition, or even you, um, were not aware of any current talks that could have been going on. In other words, it lends to um, the situation where Mr. Fraser could be speaking with them also. It's possible because um, you may not know about it. Mm -hmm. Or Mr. Turnbull could be speaking with them also. Do you see, uh, Mr. Fraser, Turnbull, going down that road? That po possibility exists that you could go down that road also because the other situation with Maduro Keynes was done in silence? And then you could also be speaking with them also then. Or with you, uh, yeah. Um, but, but the point is that... Do you that see you going down that road? I, I can't speak for what, what, what go down, what will go down the road and what decision person will make. And, and the two members are here and they could speak for themselves. But the reality is that our Maduro Keynes made a decision to move on with the Virgin Islands Party. We've put out a statement, I've put out a statement early this week. We've moved on. We're here to talk about the plans for the opposition moving forward to how we are going to keep the government honest, hold their feet to the fire, ensure that we ensure that this territory and the people of this territory are, are given the best leadership to be able to create an environment that could help develop the economy, help develop the lives and create jobs for people in this territory. There are a lot of people in this country that are hurting. They need jobs. We have a job to do and we're going to execute our job. Uh, in regards to your question, um, I just want to say to you that it is true that anything is possible. But in terms of people crossing the floor, from 1999 when I joined the political arena and became a member of the legislature, between 1999 and 2003, that was one administration. How many people crossed the floor? It was something like three. Between 2003 and 2007, well, we didn't have any Yes, we did. We had people cross the floor. Well, there was a minister who got relieved and crossed over or whatever. Somebody did cross the floor in that time. Between 2007 and 2011, well, we had an 11 to 2 majority and um, everyone held, held the hell serve. Nothing happened. 2011 to 2015, we had attrition. People left. 2015 to 2019, a multitude of people crossed the floor. Ministers, backbenchers, junior ministers. So uh, you're looking at this as some big surprise or... Uh, uh, we, we were surprised because we weren't afforded the courtesy of a discussion before it happened. And I think that, that that's the great unfortunate part about the whole thing, the courtesy of a discussion, uh, you know. But as far as crossing, hmm. And as far as the numbers are concerned, yes, you would like to have a big opposition, but I've been in opposition of two. And I've seen opposition of two, and each time you have an opposition of two, the following, the following election, the government change. So we're going to make the best of the situation that we have. We have a program, which the leader of the opposition just laid out, and we intend to pursue it with vigor. One of the major objectives and the driving force is to have the Public Accounts Committee up and running. It took a year to get there. Our first meeting, as he said, is February 4th. And we have been making preparations, and we continue to make preparations to make it a viable public accounts committee. And the chairman must know, 
He's been there before. He must know that the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, who is who happens to be the leader of the opposition, has a lot of work to do. And he got to have a lot of courage to get it done. Well, I think the 2015 to 19 administration, I would have been in part of the multitude of three. <laughs> it would have been four if my honorable um, sister hadn't departed, a seam sister. But the, 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 the question and those that know me, and I think each of us relationship, and I've had a relationship with Honorable Alvin Maduro Keynes before politics. So if you intend or, or expect to get a disrespectful view from me as it relates to her, it's not going to happen. Um, she had a decision to make. She made her decision. Um, the way in which it was done, again, I think all the other members before me said it. Um, to this date, I have been unable to speak with her. But it's a decision that she made. But I believe what our job is, is to remain focused. I shared with Honorable Penn and Honorable Fraser and Honorable Vanterpool that the way... I have to look at my life, and everybody will say, because you know, especially in the media, it's out there, it's all, all over the place that the jumping ship and who's next and this and that. And it seemed like my name, easy to call, I like to call my name. But I, I, am, I am of the opinion and principle that anything in my life, if it comes too easy, is definitely not for me. So we have all agree that we are going to hold the government accountable. The PAC, and I don't want to just leave that it took a year. I know Honorable Fraser didn't intend for it to, but within this world that we live in, it took a year for the PAC to be formed only because the government didn't want to agree on how many members could sit on it because they only had one member that could sit on it who was not a minister or junior minister. So we got that uh, rectified. So it is not any fault of the opposition for it taking a year. You could put that blame on the government. After all, it is, in fact, their government now. Um, but we are, we are steadfast in our views that we will hold not only hold the government accountable in what they say, but now the actions of the PAC will be that driving force to ensure that we are doing the things that we have a responsibility to do together with these press conferences, together with the, the meetings in the sister islands and throughout the communities of the Virgin Islands so that there is a voice outside of all the excess chatter um, that we continue to hear in this territory that will not go unchallenged. Good morning, um, Kayla Kinesha Forbes from 284 Media. Um, we've been hearing a lot about fast talk. And um, Honorable Penn, you have somewhat checked the government about this medical marijuana mm -hmm. industry that they are now you know, playing upon. And as you so rightfully said, um, revenues are down in the financial services. So I now want to hear the stance of the entire opposition as it relates to the medical marijuana industry. I'll go after you. I already put my position on the record. Thank you. I presume that that's a part of agriculture. <laughs> I, I would imagine that agriculture being dead, there's some, some kind of hype will be important to the government to get it going. I, I too would like to know about this medical marijuana. It's, it's ironic that someone would call me yesterday and ask me about how they can get involved in the farming aspect of it. And I, I thought it, it would be good for me to, to uh, consult the minister on this aspect as to how it's going to be, the pro what the program is going to be about, how it's going to be farmed and all the rest of it. But I could tell you right now that it is popular. 
it's something that's catchy right now. I think Jamaica is the first Caribbean country that made a pitch for it. And then now I hear the U.S. Virgin Islands is making a pitch for it. And there has been talk about it here in the territory before this government came in. I was surprised at the, the vigor with which they, they took it on. But like everything else, the programs that the government are announcing, the background and the details don't filter down to the opposition. I'm not saying that they're hiding it from us. Maybe they don't have it themselves. But it's popular and it sounds good to start talking about the millions of dollars that can be derived from such a, uh, uh, an ish initiative. So we too, uh, I don't know if any of my colleagues have any specificity about it, but we too would be interesting in knowing more about this program that they're talking about, where it's going to be and who's going to be um, involved, who is going to be involved in it. Do you support it? I, I, it's impossible to support something that you don't know about. I need to know more about it. If I know about it and I can see exactly what it is, then I can make an intelligent uh, decision as to whether or not I support it. The, the, the question about medical marijuana and, and, again, the hype behind it, in a press conference or in in whatever interview was happening you you blurt it out and it becomes sensationalized that the community pick it up that government gonna do something with marijuana and those who um, have the farming capabilities became excited and found it of a way you know that this is something to get involved with but there's no details there's no facts there's no discussion being done matter of fact you don't even hear the minister for the subject speaking about it it's the premier that's leading um these things that fall under a minister but what what is bothering to to me is that you hear from the farmers and you hear from the persons in the community again this is the opportunity to rebuild this territory and i had a conversation as recently as this morning with one of my favorite seniors and 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 they said to me you're talking about marijuana you got weed all over the place we need to plant food we need to get back to the basics of what got us here when we continue to look for the f quick fixes and we look at the quote-unquote the revenue uh, uh, that they, they continue to portray, again, smokes and mirrors, what are we doing? How, what is the economic benefit in terms of how long has this industry now been in force? What is the BVI share in the piece of the pie in terms of where we compare to the rest of the world? You said you have in a hundred, you want to have a hundred farmers or whomever plant marijuana. I don't know if that goes towards the thousand jobs and a thousand. I don't know how it's going to work. Um, but we're just blurting out these things without details, and then the whole fanfare happens, and then by the time it comes down, nothing happens. But I hope that we don't just continue to buy into all this pumps and circumstance and we get down to the grass tax and be able to understand what we are doing, how we're going to go forward in terms of developing and bringing back agriculture and fisheries to this territory in a holistic manner that we are not always important but we start to be able to provide so that we could provide and um, there's farmers all over especially within my community in the district there are farmers all over the BVI that want to get back into farming but nothing is being done but anything that sounds excited we put it out there for the public to go crazy about without any meat or substance <clears throat> um, thank you, thank you for your question, Kyla. And I'll just weigh in quickly. Um, I mean, my colleagues did a good job in, in terms of outlining, and, and it's really 
a lot of hype with, with no substance behind the whole plan and the whole the whole issue of, of medical marijuana and marijuana in general. And I want to say something though. I mean, marijuana is illegal. Marijuana is illegal currently in the BBI, and we've yet to see any legislation or any hear any discussion or any draft to talk about the decriminalization of marijuana. But yet still we're out there talking about 100 farmers, 100 this, 100 that. And the basics, foundation in terms of what needs to happen, has not happened as yet. You know, we have young men that are going to jail every day for smoking a joint, for, for smoking weed, and, 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 and losing their entire lives and entire career over that. And I've not heard anything from the Premier or his government about their plans for decriminalization. And, and, and the, de the detail is very critical. <clears throat> One, the biggest challenge with this industry is the banking of funds. The U.S. has legalized it in several states, but they cannot bank the funds into federal, because it's still illegal on the federal level. So they cannot bank the monies into the, the banks in the U.S. <clears throat> we in the Caribbean have a major issue, the whole issue of the risking. And you're asking all banks, which they would not do, to bank funds. So you have another issue. If they do bank these funds from, from marijuana and medical marijuana, um, they have a risk of, of losing their licenses um, in terms of um, the, the issue with, with, with the whole banking issue with, with correspondent banking. Um, there's an issue of, of just not a clear path in terms of what trying to, we're trying to achieve. I have been on record uh, in supporting the whole issue of decriminalization because I believe that we should not continue to do that and imprison our young people for smoking a joint. We need to have some type of approach to, to, to stem the path. And we have not heard any discussion from our government on that. They're the, the showing all these figures, about $5 million a year in revenue. Um, my colleague made a very important point. <clears throat> There's no holistic approach to development of the agricultural industry. We read that cabinet made a decision to give the property that is owned by the fisheries to the ports. They are going to level that area and turn it into a port facility. You haven't heard yet where the next fishing complex is going to be. Fishing is a very viable industry for this territory. We yet to see a plan in how we're going to address the issue of fishing. And the issue of, of just growing food and food security in this territory, there's no plan. Uh, so it's just a lot of smoke and mirrors, a lot of sensationalization to our young people. Uh, who they feel want these things and want to hear of these things and, 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 and there's no substance behind how it's going to really benefit their lives. You look at St. Vincent who is well, who's well advanced in the medical, medical marijuana industry and persons who are doing that and you look at the revenues that are being derived currently. St. Vincent is an agricultural economy. They've been that way for years. And you're looking at, 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 at the farmers making somewhere around 100 EC dollars a year, uh, a, a pound, or uh, whatever it was in terms of the other thing. It's not viable. It's BBI in terms of the, 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 the cost of doing business in the BBI, what it would cost to grow and, and produce, and the infrastructure that's required. Um, I, I don't see it. The numbers that the Premier is talking, it just doesn't add up. And if, and if he has some other numbers that we are not aware of, I think he needs to bring it to the legislative body. So we can have a discussion of it's a viable industry for the people of this territory and they could really make a bet, make a bit. We will we will support it. But but there's nothing that we could say that we could support a year or no. But we are not uh, and I in particular uh, is on record on saying at least the decriminalization to at least keep our young men out of prison as relates to um, just the basic smoking on marijuana. Thank you. Wow. Uh, good morning, Dan Campa from the uh, BBI Deacons. Uh, so, uh, in his recent uh, first district speak, uh, speech, the Premier Andrew Foy mentioned um, <coughs> infrastructure at the uh, West End for open burning and progress being made with the control panel. Uh, have you heard any updates on this project? And uh, secondarily, what sort of infrastructure projects do you want to prioritize going into the new year? Well, well, I haven't heard any of this other than what I saw in the media coming from both the Premier and the Deputy Premier currently. I think that's an important subject. I know the member for the third, it, it, it lies within his constituency. I know his people have been clamoring for this issue to be addressed. The issue of open born is a serious issue for us. The entire issue of waste management in the territory is a major issue uh, for this territory. We have to get a grip 
on a, a clear path to managing our waste in this territory. You see the, the bulky waste that's being dumped across the territory, not just in town and parcel as all the waste, everywhere in the territory. It's not just the government's problem, <coughs> excuse me, it's all of our problem. It's something that we need to find, come together and, and find a, a comprehensive solution to address. And the people have a role to play in this as well. Um, the public has, has a role to play. The roads are in the pro the probable condition. I know there was a CDB loan that was done to address the road infrastructure in many areas of this territory where there's serious undermining, more particularly in my area going towards the east um, from Hope Hill, go towards um, the, the Josiah's Bay area. So at the, at the end of the day, the government sets the agenda. Uh, we, as, as the opposition, have a responsibility to ensure that we agitate for the people of this territory, where we see that their needs um, of their, their certain needs for the people of the territory, whether it's road, economy, and those those key areas, we will continue to agitate on their behalf. As the member for the second district just just pointed out, that it's it's at that point now where the government has to assume ownership of whatever ills they meant or whatever ills there are in the territory at this particular point. We said February 26, so we'll wait till February 26 to make sure that that's the case. I don't want to. I don't want to start a minute or before because we made a promise. But as far as the incinerator is concerned, November 2018 is the date that the incinerator went down. To have it on the commission to this day is unacceptable. I don't care what or who says that it's done and they can't get it up and it's, it's unacceptable because the, the burning of garbage in the open in a community right here in the BVI and people in St. John and St. Thomas are complaining about it. You could imagine what is hap what's happening to the folks in, the city, in that community. People in this territory are dying from cancer like flies and for some reason, nothing is being done on the government side about it. And I, I, like I said, February 26 is the date. So whoever served before that, this, this is directed to them as well. It has to stop. We got issues of mold in the territory and nothing is happening. I am putting out there and I put it out before, it is time for our citizens to start filing class action lawsuits against the government, something that I support and will support even if I have to help support it financially. Governments must stop pe uh, killing their people. Simple, straight and, straight and simple. Victimizing their people through so many various forms. This one is unacceptable and it must stop. Imagine Hurricane Irma came and it destroyed, or dis not destroyed, it, it damaged, not destroyed, damaged the sewage treatment plant at Burt Point. The only sewage treatment plant that treats waste from the metropolitan Rotong area, that's Bargos Bay, Purcell, Huntum Gut, Rotong, McNamara, and dumps that raw sewage out in Slaney, in the waters in Slaney. Everybody goes about their business as, as business as usual. If, if, you wanna, if you want an example of what I'm talking about, so you can put a timeline to what I'm talking about. Imagine the traffic lights that were out. They, came, they, were, they went out with the hurricane. You see how long it took to get them back up and running? That's what I'm talking about. So you don't see the fact that the sewage is being, the raw sewage is being dumped in the ocean. You don't see it, so it's out of sight, out of mind. But it's happening, and it needs to stop. So. I am appealing to government, ministers, to take control of your ministries and make sure that whatever is within your portfolio is getting the kind of attention that is necessary to make it function. You leave it up to the officers. Officers reach, meet roadblock and, and, and sometimes they just can't get past those roadblocks. They need a minister's intervention. Ministers, I'm appealing to you 
to ensure that these things happen. That incinerator in Parkwood Pond is no excuse whatsoever. For me, for crying out loud, the, the electrician died during the time of the process. It took so long. Mm -hmm. So let's get this thing over with. Malika McPherson, the Island Sun newspaper. Uh, Leader of the opposition, this question is also um, extended to the other opposition members there. You started this, your statement by doing a recap on what happened, um, on what you discussed at the last meeting, but you made two weighty comments. You talked about victimization has increased, and you talked about it being extended to family members of the opposition. Um, would the three members at the head table please explain what you mean by this? <laughs> We, I mean, we, we get reports daily about the issues that are being faced by persons within this territory, substantiated reports uh, by persons who are facing this territory in terms of victimization of this um, current administration. Um, person called me just the other day, and I'm not, not going to use anybody's name. And they were told, you're probably not getting this job because you voted for Marlon. That is, that is the, the plight of persons in this territory on a daily basis in terms of this sort of bully mentality that's happening currently with this administration, not just from the, 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 the members of, of the government, but the, the support base. It's this bully mob type like mentality that's, that's permeating throughout this territory. The specifics in terms of opposition member, that will come out in short order. You'll hear about that soon. Um, the specific, and it's, it's, my, it's me directly, and I, I'll, I'll put that to the public when the time is right. But it, it is happening. It continues to happen. We are concerned specifically with the boards. I, I mentioned the boards. The, the board, board members are getting involved in the day-to-day -day operation of the boards. That is unheard of in corporate government structure. The board has a, a responsibility to set policy direction for the boards and operation of the boards. There's an executive management team who is responsible for ensuring that these boards are run in an efficient manner. They have a role to play in the running of these boards, specifically. And we're concerned. And, and as a public accounts committee, we're going to look in the, in, into these concerns, these issues that are raised by persons on the boards within these corporate structures, persons who, in the public as well, and that's something that the member for the third and I, we spoke about, that we have to expand the, um, the role of the public accounts committee and from a policy framework in terms of the people of this territory and the way that they're, way they're treated. There need to be recourse when you are being um, disenfranchised, where you are being pushed aside by your government or your administration. And, and, and it should not be go, it should not go unchallenged, it should not go unchecked in terms of what's happening to people in this territory, what are happening to, to very pe close people to us. And this territory, in terms of the level of victimization, is that being all handed out by this government. I think I think my position continues to be constant. Melvin Mitch Dumble has had. Currently has, and I think will never had have a hidden agenda. My opportunity that was granted to me by the people of the second district and the larger Virgin Islands was to serve the needs of the people of the Virgin Islands and not myself or any other interest except their rights, their concerns, and the overall development and building of a future for Virgin Islands. So the the things and the complaints that the Honorable Penn just, just mentioned, well, I, I get them as well. I don't care which government it is. If you are wrong in one Virgin Island, that is one too much. Our job as elected members of this honorable house and this territory is to be able to serve the people 
that gave us an opportunity to be here. But when you serve yourself, that's where victimization, when you don't have the people at heart. Now, you could do a good job at saying it, but your actions, the things that you do, the directives that you give will be felt. And people of those Virgin Islands, especially, I keep going back, that's, that's, that's now my soundboard in terms of foundation. I go back from the hurricanes of 2017. We were given an opportunity to begin again. The people of the Virgin Islands' eyes were not only open, but their voices started to speak on their displeasure with how government was operating. And now you have a new administration carrying on in some case in cases worse than before but now doing things to people and their families under the name of this is the way we're going to do it we have a responsibility to serve that's my only focus and i will continue to be the voice of the people of virgin Islands to ensure that anytime they are wrong that i will speak on their behalf I'm all here from BVA News. Um, my question is basically um, directed at um, firstly Mr. Um, Fraser and Mr. Turnbull. Um, well, prior to the departure of uh, Major Keynes, um, the NDP had a, a three in five majority in opposition. Um, but now that she has crossover, it's, it's two in four. So, um, to Mr. Fraser, you know, basically you were once an opposition leader. Um, is there any thoughts in your mind of possibly challenging for that post? I don't, I don't understand your math. You says two and four. What do you mean? In terms of, um, you know, your two. I think in terms of your independent regarding the. No, it's in the opposition is one one two. Oh, sorry. Well, one one two. Sorry. One one two. Right. Yes. As in two, two NDPs basically and one one Progressives United progressive, and sorry and one um, independent sorry no 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 the, the, I'm Progressives United PVIM. and PVIM so you got PVIM and Progressives United and and NDP right the so other NDP isn't here so it's two one one well so two one one but, um in terms of the majority in terms of the three five um but you know obviously I'm um, gone. So in terms of you know, it's, it's in terms of a, a possible challenge challenge for the um, you know as far as opposition. I just wanted to, to get your thoughts on whether that would have been a, a, a thought in your mind. Is there a precedent for such action? I'm not sure. <laughs> You're not sure. Okay, well, I think you ought to leave things the way they are right now. <laughs> I, I don't think that that is something that I want to discuss at this point. I mean, I, I, I never thought on it, so you brought it up, so I can't respond at this point. And also, um, regarding... Um, you want him to answer? Yes, yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I'm I'm still trying to understand the question because there there are three different parties. Now the leader of the opposition is the member of the NDP with Honorable Vanterpool. So there are two members who still have a majority in the in the opposition. Um, Honorable Fraser and myself um, we have discussed even before the departure of. Honorable Keynes. Matter of fact, we've all discussed together that we have to work as an opposition to support the leader of the opposition in his current position to build a force to hold the government accountable. So I know, again, in the minds of the people, we strive on contention and we strive on negativity. Where I am right now, my position is to ensure that we hold the government accountable. Honorable Marlon Penn is the leader of the opposition. Um, unless he says otherwise, I don't see anything changing. 
Okay, my second question is directed to the leader of the opposition, Mr. Penn. I know the last time we had an opposition um, meeting here, you would have said basically that you are yet to receive um, terms of reference for any of the um, consultancy contracts from government that were issued under the, the VAP yeah. um, administration. Today, have you received any knowledge or any information regarding such? We yet to re have yet to receive those, and, and it seems to be a habit that when we ask questions in our House or Assembly, we don't get questions answered and in the details of those questions. We also ask about the details concerning the fast track process because um, there's a lot of things that are being speculated related to the fast track process. The minister at the time, when I asked the question in the house, said he would make that available to us um, the next week. Uh, we're now in 2020. We've yet to get that detail concerning the fast track process. So again, it, it seems to be I, I, I have a, um, a letter drafted to write to him again concerning the details. I mean, it's just it's, it's information for the people. It's public information once it's asked in the Albert House of Assembly, and the people of this territory need to know. And sorry, I know you would have mentioned it in terms of letters issued to the, to the Premier, et cetera. Um, were there any talks in person, like when you see him, or any, any in that case regarding that, like you would directly mention it to him? I've mentioned to both him and the Speaker concerning the details of um, that those questions that I've asked in Arbor House. And we know subsequently there's several new consultancy that have been issued since. And we will probe uh, when the next House meeting, whenever that happens. But the people need to get the details, and, and then Premier and his government needs to answer the questions of the people. It's not the questions for myself, Mar Marlon Penn, or Honorable Julian Fraser, or Honorable um, Mitch Tombo. It's the questions for the people. This is the people's information, and, and he needs to provide information to the people. Okay, my final question, since I only was allowed two. Um, regarding the, um, you know, I know you would have said the public accounts committee is scheduled for February 4th. Okay. Um, so far, in terms of trying to get answers from the government, et cetera, it has been a challenge. Do you think that the public accounts committee will be effective in terms of carrying out their duties when it comes down to actually the first meeting and going forward? It, it will be effective, Carl. We intend to make sure it's effective. We have a, a very robust schedule. We intend to meet every week to ensure that we go through in detail the audited reports that are laid before um, the public, the ones that are came to the House of Assembly, the ones who yet to come to the House of Assembly. Um, there are new initiatives that the government has, undertake, has undertaken. Festival, as I mentioned, is one of those things that have grave concern to us. $2 million went up in poof in the air in two weeks. Uh, we need to give account for that $2 million. Um, this issue of the premier security contract, the private security firm where we were paying $86,000 a year, uh, a month, and then that went on for 10 months. I understand that we now have um, the police who is providing that private security. There are a host of issues. There's the neighborhood project that happened some time ago that we never had a fully report ventilated. There's even the BVI Airways. There's, there's a, there's a Mostoke High School wall. There's all these things even that happened under my administration that we need to look at. And if there are things that happen and things that we could, could recommend in terms of corrective measures, we would do so. And it is not about my, gov my past administration, the past VIP administration, or any other administration, about making sure that the institutions of the House of Assembly work. They work in the best interest of the people, not in the best interest of any political party or organization. And that's our mandate, and that's our objective, to ensure that these institutions work. You asked a question whether or not the leader of the opposition can ensure a guarantee that the public accounts committee is going to be effective because he can't get answers from the government. We want to we want to make it public. Uh, we want to make it abundantly clear at this particular juncture, going into this next public accounts committee. We are not going to rely only on government to supply information to us. We will be calling private citizens before the public accounts committee. Any private citizen or company that had business with the government of the Virgin Islands is open to be summoned before the Public Accounts Committee. And I think, and they must answer the questions whether or not the matter is in court. Check, check, Oskin May, it's there. We have that power to do, the power to do those things. And answers we must get. And if I listen to the Premier correct and carefully, if everyone listen to him, if he makes a statement regarding his government, he talks about transparency and that you can't be public, private and public. I believe him. So I'm sure he'll welcome the Public Accounts Committee keeping his government accountable. And as the, min, min, as the leader of the opposition said, it's not about this particular administration. It's things that took place before as well. 
I just want to um, lend my voice to to support and say that I agree with the both the leader of the opposition and member for the third um, in their answer to the question because if you pay attention to Honorable Fraser referenced the Ask in May, but if you look at the powers that the Public Accounts Committee has, um, it is left to us to utilize those powers, not to abuse them, but to utilize those powers to be able to effect and get the answers that we are seeking. So we do have the powers to someone's persons to before the body and get the answers that we that we uh, require to be able to relate to the public and to the, the, the BVI community the things that may not be so clear or um, the fast talk may apparently seem to want to cover up. But we have a job to do and again, I am saying that we will do our job. Mr. Turnbull, have you been able to find the money that's missing from the Festival Affairs Committee for last year? And um, how much money missing? Um, you said money is missing. How much money is missing? And have you been able to find it? I, I never said money is missing. I said something went wrong somewhere. Because when I looked at the report, um, and somebody said to me, Mitch, you know numbers. And you called 680-something thousand in the last press conference. But I calculated, as I did, 480 something so I said well I didn't see the monies for the stage so I appropriated about two hundred thousand dollars for the stage but there's still some monies that not accounted for but what I was told um, what we were told and I was reminded that this was the preliminary report from festival so I pray to God that within the next couple of weeks before the next house meeting is called that we could get the final report because this is something that I will not rest on and the people of the Virgin Islands have the right to know how their monies were spent because we are approaching April again where you have the Virgin Gorda Festival so we cannot continue to let things go unchallenged I have raised the issue because it is in fact the issue and I will continue to bring back questions until we get answers. So there is some things that have gone adrift that we must highlight, identify, and correct. We, um, I think that's that's the last question. I'll just let the um, the members give any final statements, and then I'll, I'll wrap up the um, the press conference. Well, I want to thank I want to thank the people of the Virgin Islands. I want to thank the media. Um, to it for um, JTV as well as ZBVI and all the other persons who have come today. Um, we are here to represent the concerns of the people of the Virgin Islands to do our job as the opposition, no matter what might happen, no matter what may seem to be popular. I believe that if we stay committed to the persons that put us here and be honest that our job will become that much easier. So for me, I am steadfast in understanding that I have a job to do to represent the people of the second district, but also within the opposition to hold the government accountable and to challenge them on things that um, they have not been doing so far. Um, again, all the fast talk, I will check it because even within my second district community, there are some things that were publicized to be done and a lot of them have been halted um so you will be hearing from me soon and we will get out into the community and do what we have to do we are here as the opposition and we want to thank each and everyone for tuning in to listening and we ask that god continue to bless these beautiful virgin islands i too want to lend my voice in so in in saying that Extending a thank you to the media for joining us this morning and making this press conference possible. I want to put the people of the third district on notice 
that on Thursday, January 30th, I'll be having a public meeting at the Valley O. Thomas Community Center in Seacows Bay at 7.30 p.m. Joining me at that meeting will be the BVI Red Cross, who will be presenting on their enhanced vulnerability and capacity assessment carried out on the Seacows Bay area. The enhanced vulnerability and capacity assessment is an approach of the Red Cross Red Crescent Societies. It is a participatory process developed to assist communities to become more resilient through the assessment and analysis of the risk they are facing and the identification of solutions to address them. Sikowsby has been designated one of the most vulnerable communities in the territory and is therefore the subject of this first ever assessment by these societies. Other district initiatives and projects will be announced and discussed at the meeting after the presentation is made. We have projects coming up in the district where there's the Sikowsby Child Well Road, which most people refer to as, as Elevator Road, Hill or whatever, is in terrible state of disrepair is going to be closed for a period in order to carry out some substantial repairs to the road. In Hannah's proper, there are some roads that will be resurfaced, and in Palestina, we'll be building a retaining wall there. The water situation, I want the people to come out so we can discuss it and have the government to understand that it's crucial and something that is vital to the survival of our community. I talk about the the, the incinerator already in the press conference just recently, and the sewage situation. So there are a host of other uh, of issues that, that are important to the people of the district, and I'm encouraging them to come out to that meeting. Further notice will be given. Thank you so much once again for coming. Again, I would like to join my colleagues in thanking you, the media, for playing your role in ensuring that there's balance. Uh, in the discourse between government and opposition, you, I want to thank you again for answering the call and being here um, on a short, such short notice. To the people of the Virgin Islands who listen in, those who are listening via ZBVI Radio, I think we can sell on there now. But those who are watching on JTV and watching live on Facebook, I thank you for your indulgence as we discuss um, our way forward as opposition. We have an important role to play as opposition, and we have a responsibility to represent the interests of all the people of this territory, not just the people that voted for us, but the wider Virgin Islands. And we intend to do that and execute that role with the highest of integrity, accountability, and transparency, as you hear our government always say. We intend to be sh make sure that we hold them accountable for the programs and plans that they have put in place, that they put in motion. And we want to all see what's best, what, what all want what is best for these Virgin Islands. And, and we have a job to play to making sure that the people of the Virgin Islands um, have uh, enjoy, continue to enjoy the quality of life that they've grown accustomed to. So again, we look forward to sharing with you our plans. We are going to be across the Virgin Islands, to the sister islands, throughout our districts, talking about um, the way forward. Um, we want to hear your concerns. We want to say to the people of the territory that we're going to fact check the government. Um, when they bring things and programs to the plate, we want to make sure that you get proper and accurate information so that you can make intelligible decision. Um, and, and the smoke and mirrors, we want to make sure that we break some of those mirrors and we have one reflection, the true reflection of what's happening in this territory and ensure that you, the people of this territory, get the best um, moving forward. Again, thank you. We look forward to continuing the discourse. Um, once we get the Public Accounts Committee up and running, we'll be reporting to you, the public, periodically on what our findings are. And as we lay reports on, on the table in the House of Assembly as we move forward, I thank you. God bless you and have a pleasant um, weekend when it comes. Thank you.